subscribe tag tv youtube channel and press the notification button people have to live in in unity we are still in transition civil society has been decimated of course we rely on media and i think the government has not done enough the international community has failed to respond no place in the world is perfect the yoga event is held here severe injustice and they should be stopped we should raise our voices condemn this uh, brutal act Hello viewers welcome to Newsweek South Asia a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations let's begin with the headlines first India exposes Pakistan at United Nations assembly Islamic state expanding its presence in South Asia under Pakistan's patronage says Afsas and Pakistan nurturing and sponsoring Khalistan separatists says Canadian think tank Terrorism poses grave threat to global peace and security and the United Nations provides a platform to all the countries around the world to discuss this threat and the mechanisms to eradicate it But Imran Khan prime minister of Pakistan the terror breeding nation once again misused the august platform to peddle lies and propaganda However, India which is dedicated towards world peace and prosperity not only spoke about the threat that terrorism poses to human lives but also gave a befitting reply to Pakistan's fabricated statements on Jammu and Kashmir and its irrational blustering. We have a report. Terrorism is the grossest affront to the enjoyment of inalienable human right to life and to live in peace and security. It poses a serious threat to economic and social development. undermines democracy and jeopardizes the rule of law it is an attack against freedom of thought expression and association at the ongoing sessions of the united nations human rights council and the un general assembly india extensively talked about the kind of impact that terrorism leaves on any peaceful society while islamabad misused the forum of the united nations to further its agenda against new delhi the latter used the platform to call out those who are the sponsors of terrorism and maintain that the UN assembly should hold such countries responsible for spreading the menace of terrorism India will always speak in support of peace security and prosperity India will not hesitate in raising its voice against the enemies of humanity human race and human values these include terrorism smuggling of illegal weapons drugs and money laundering i congratulate his excellency pakistan's prime minister imran khan as usual passed erroneous and unwarranted statements on jammu and kashmir in his speech at the unga imran khan not only ranted about the abrogation of article 370 but also made false claims about indian army Khan also tried to portray his Satan masters as angels as he went on to say that Pakistan army is least involved in cross border shelling at the LOC in less than a week of Imran's speech three indian soldiers got martyred in the cross border shelling by Pakistan proving that the pm has been using the august international forums to make false and bogus statements india's first secretary at the un general assembly mijito vinito had staged a walk out from the UNGA hall as soon as Pakistan prime minister Imran Khan raised the Kashmir issue later exercising the right to reply the indian delegate slammed pakistan for its fabricated statements on jammu and kashmir asserting that the union territory is an integral part of india and the only dispute lies in the region which is under forceful and illegal occupation of pakistan mr president Let me assert here loud and clear the union territory of jammu and kashmir is an integral and inalienable part of india the rules and legislations brought in the union territory of jammu and kashmir are strictly internal affairs of india the only dispute left in kashmir relates to that part of kashmir that is still under illegal occupation of pakistan 
We call upon Pakistan to vacate all those areas that it is in illegal occupation of. What should rather be on the agenda of the United Nations is Pakistan's deep state and its unrelenting political and financial support to terrorist organizations and mercenaries which are a threat to global peace and security. Highlighting that Pakistan's Prime Minister is the same person who had referred to Osama bin Laden as a martyr in the parliament, India's first secretary further hit out at the country for being a rock state that provides pensions and shelters to some of the dreaded terrorists of the world. This is the same country that provides pensions for dreaded and listed terrorists out of state funds. This is the same country that has the dubious distinction of hosting the largest number of terrorists proscribed by the United Nations. The leader whom we heard today is the same person who referred to the terrorist Osama bin Laden as a martyr in his parliament in July. The same leader who spewed venom today admitted in 2019 in public in the US that his country still has about 30,000 to 40,000 terrorists who have been trained by Pakistan and have fought in Afghanistan and in the Indian Union territory of Jammu and Kashmir. Pakistan since decades has been using all August global platforms to spew venom against India. Its representatives pass fabricated and slanderous statements to further their anti-India propaganda. But eventually, to its much embarrassment, India puts the truth forward, hence exposing all its lies and unmoral terror connections. On several occasions, Pakistan has been accused by Afghan administration of colluding with the Taliban. Kabul blames Islamabad for the rising violence and instability in Afghanistan. Pakistan on the other side maintains that it wants peace at its western border and supports the Afghanistan peace process. But that's its public face and stance. Privately, it has been holding talks and meetings with the terror leaders to maintain chaos in the region. Recently, as Sanullah Hassan, leader of Pakistan Taliban released an audio clip exposing the fact how Pakistan Army and ISI take the help of several terror leaders to fulfill their evil agendas against India and Afghanistan. Our report. Terrorism has become an institution in Pakistan and has extensive support from its army and the intelligence, which consider it as a strategic weapon. Every time after getting rebuked by the FATF, the Pakistani government cleverly tries to dodge international pressure by temporarily clamping down on terrorism until the focus shifts away. However, contrary to Pakistan's imagination, terror leaders, nurtured and sponsored by its intelligence, are now exposing Islamabad's blatant lies and false claims in front of the world. Recently, former Pakistani Taliban spokesperson Ehsanullah Ehsan, who had escaped Pakistani custody earlier this year, revealed that he was asked by the Director General of Pakistan's Inter-Service Intelligence to not make any statement against the Army and intelligence agencies and also offered him to resolve the issues through dialogue. Earlier in August this year, Ehsanullah also claimed that he was asked by the Pakistan security agencies to lead a death squad in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and was given a hit list of names of people to be killed in the northwestern province. उन्होंने हमें कहा कि हम आपको पिशावर मर्दान और कोयटा में खुफिया दफातर बनाकर देते हैं और आप गद्दारों और मुल्क दुश्मनों के खिलाफ काम शुरू कर दें जो लिस्ट मुझे दिया गया था उसमें ज्यादातर अपराध का ताल्लुक खैबर पख्तूनख्वा से था और वो सब पश्तून थे जिसमें जिंदगी के हर शोबे से ताल्लुक रखने वाले अपराध के नाम थे जिनमें कुछ सहाफी हजरात के नाम भी शामिल थे दीज क्लेम्स बाय एहसानुल्ला एहसान रिवील द डीप रिलेशंस ऑफ द पाकिस्तानी आर्मी विद द तालिबान and clearly expose the fact that how its intelligence agencies use non-state actors like the Taliban to fulfill their evil agendas. Being very well aware of this fact, the Afghan administration too reached out to Pakistan to support in brokering the intra-Afghan peace negotiations. Relations between Pakistan and Afghanistan have long been rocky. Afghanistan officials, including Abdullah and its international allies, have accused Pakistan of backing the Taliban insurgents as a way to limit the influence of old rival India in Afghanistan. Still, Afghanistan's top peace official, 
Abdullah Abdullah recently visited Pakistan and asked Pakistan's military and Prime Minister Imran Khan to use their influence to press the Taliban into a reduction of violence and make serious efforts to achieve peace. It was communicated to the Taliban that it is important for them, it is important uh, for their relations with Pakistan, it's report, it is important uh, for Afghanistan that they set around the negotiating table. Does that suffice? That, that's, uh, does that uh, put an end to the suffering of our people? But no, of course. Uh, but the thing is that uh, it's a start. Uh, and uh, the start of it uh, was the start of negotiations was supported by, by Pakistan. Contrary to the expectations of Afghans, the violence by the Taliban in the country is getting worse even as efforts are underway to end the decades-long conflict of Afghanistan through a political settlement. Once again, a wave of attacks across the nation left multiple people dead and wounded, including a major roadside bomb attack on a bus in the central province of Daikundi, which killed at least 15 civilians, including women and children. The much-awaited inter-Afghan dialogue began on September 12th in Doha as government negotiators sit across the table from the Taliban to plot a future course for a post-war Afghanistan. However, the demands of a ceasefire, at least during the peace talks, have been blatantly ignored by the Taliban. In the last few years, the Islamic State has declared a series of provinces in South Asia, including the infamous province of Khorasan near Afghan-Pakistan border, and as a result, its threat is growing exponentially in India, Pakistan and Sri Lanka. Islamic State's Khorasan province in South Asia is gaining strength as it is well organized and supported by intelligence agencies such as the ISI. An Amsterdam-based think tank recently held a virtual seminar over the threat caused by the rising influence of ISIS in South Asia. A report. After the fall of the Caliphate in Syria and Iraq, the Islamic State is fast spreading its network in South Asia, the region which already has a large number of terrorist and extremist groups. ISIS sympathizers, some of them former Taliban commanders, have begun active recruitment drives to widen the presence of the group in the region. To discuss the emerging threat of the Islamic State into South Asia, Amsterdam-based think tank European Foundation for South Asian Studies or EFSAS hosted a webinar titled Rise of ISIS in South Asia on the sidelines of the 45th session of the United Nations Human Rights Council. A panel of scholars, policy analysts and researchers in the field of terrorism and South Asian politics deliberated upon the origins of the Islamic State of Khorasan province its main areas of operation and assist its number of fighters mostly belonging to Pakistani origin. So the ISKP have been very active in Nangarhar, subduing large areas, including whole districts up to a period. The force also attempted to project itself further, attempting to establish a presence in places like Helmand and Kandahar in the south, Ghazni in the southeast, and even the north, up into Balkh and Faryab in the, in the northwest. They've had a lot less success in this. ISKP have also targeted Shia Muslims and the city of Kabul. Mass casualty attacks uh, are a major feature of ISKP's military operations, and ISKP would love to trigger sectarian violence. Eastern Afghanistan allows them the potential to do this, offering valuable resources and opportunities for all insurgent groups. It borders the safe havens in Pakistan, the Spingar mountain range that forms the southern boundary between Nangarhar province and Pakistan is a tough geographical barrier, difficult for US, Afghan or Pakistani militaries to penetrate. The Khyber Pass area offers a good smuggling hub for arms, fighters and narcotics. The Islamic State of Khorasan province has been accused of carrying out attacks on behalf of the Haqqani network and the lashkar e taiba in Afghanistan and India. Various reports suggest that Pakistani deep state is pushing the Haqqani network to increase its state in ISKP to retain its leverage on Afghanistan. 
Researchers in the FSAS webinar drew similarities between the modus operandi of ISIS in Pakistan and the Haqqani network, arguing that oftentimes the two groups acquired weapons and ammunition from similar sources, which implies that the ISI keeps ISIS as an open option to be utilized for strategic depth in the future. The problem is, if you talk to the security officers of Afghanistan, uh, they will all point to the hallmarks of attacks of the ISIS uh, and say they're extremely similar to the attacks conducted by the Haqqani network. So they say ISIS is a totally different face now. Uh, when Taliban or the Pakistani ISI would like to conduct an attack, just blaming it on ISIS, simply they, they basically say, OK, we are not supporting this, uh, but actually they are doing it. We haven't seen any evidence, but again, the insurgency landscape is so fluid. Uh, material, people, uh, even resources are shared widely and extensively. But the whole discussion in Afghanistan is that the ground for all this has been uh, made by the Pakistani ISI, and they're keeping ISIS as an option. So an open option when, in case somebody else like the Taliban um, they kind of free themselves from their circle of influence. Over the years, Pakistan has gained the reputation of being a terror breeder and perpetrator and is now counted among the dreaded few for spreading mayhem across South Asia and the globe. It not only provides resources and funds for terror proliferation, but also a political patronage to allow them to unleash their devious strategies in their own style. Pakistan has been relentlessly facilitating anti-India activities. Be it Kashmir or Punjab, Islamabad has been misusing all its state machineries to push in terrorists in the valley and provoke anti-India sentiments in the form of Khalistan to disrupt peace and harmony in India. Reiterating this fact, a Canadian think tank has asserted that Pakistan still provides shelter and training to Khalistani militants and is indulged in relentless propaganda on the issue. Our report. In the early 1980 and 1990s, India's Punjab state was a hotspot of Pakistan-sponsored terrorism. During those years, Khalistan movement was being endorsed to hype the demand for a separate Sikh state within India. Moreover, Sikh youths were being provided with arms and ammunition to carry out the illegitimate separatist activities. The Khalistan movement eventually faded away by the mid-1990s, but Pakistan since then has been providing shelter to Sikh separatists. It is using propaganda machineries to mislead the Sikhs all over the world for its anti-India campaigns. A report published by a leading Canadian think tank has also reiterated this fact and said that Pakistan continues to provide training to Khalistani militants and indulges in relentless propaganda on the issue. According to the publication titled Khalistan, a project of Pakistan by the McDonnell Laurier Institute, a national public policy think tank based in Ottawa, Khalistan movement is a geopolitical project nurtured by Pakistan, threatening the national security of Canadians and Indians. The entire world knows that the Pakistani deep state continues to harbor ill will and hatred for India. They would like to go all out to somehow the other break up India and create chaos and mayhem. It clearly indicates a shift in the thinking of Canadians. Up to a point, the Canadian government was ambivalent on this. Even now, to some extent, the Canadians haven't condemned this movement to the extent that it ought to be condemned. They, along with Britain and to an extent by America and Germany, have somehow the other given Pakistan an inkling that they have the support of the Western world, which in any case doesn't exist. The fact that Khalistani militancy continues to pose a threat to India's national security was brought home in September this year, when two suspected members of the Babbar Khalsa International were arrested in Delhi. According to the media reports, the duo was plotting to commit targeted killings on directions of their Khalistani bosses who are handled by Pakistan's ISI. 
The support for Khalistan in India has sunk very low and the agenda of the Khalistani militants for a separate homeland has no takers in Punjab. But the cause still survives in Pakistan, where jihadist groups have made common cause with six separatists against their shared enemy, India. Gopal Singh Chavla, a pro-Khalistan leader based in Pakistan, who is also a close aide of Jamaat Dawa chief Hafiz Said, is just one of several examples of Khalistani militants and sympathizers getting support in Pakistan. Pakistan fully well knows that there is no support whatsoever among the Sikhs for Sikh separatism. And the concept of Khalistan is more or less dead. Despite they have absolute and total realization of this, they continue to nurture dreams of some or the other making it possible and continue to support the Sikh separatists both within, the, within India as well as those separatists who have hidden themselves in Pakistan. And with their help, they continue to pour in or attempt to pour in weapons and drugs etc. to somehow fuel this separatism. But Pakistan knows that it's a dead cause. There is no supporters or no takers for it in India. The pro-Khalistan separatists settled abroad are making repeated attempts to grab the attention of the world Sikh community by indulging in violence. Pakistan's support of Khalistani extremists involves leveraging extremists based in Canada and the United Kingdom, including supporters with ties to terrorism. From launching Referendum 2020, a secessionist campaign in Canada and London, to indoctrinating gullible youths from Punjab, ISI has taken all desperate measures to hamper peace in India. However, all their efforts have gone in vain with people rebuffing their ideology time and again. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. I am Yeshi signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.